In this video, we're going to talk about movement, and specifically subject auxiliary inversion. I kind of introduced movement in the last video with perfect phrases and progressive phrases, but we'll look at it more formally now. So first is a model of how we believe syntax works in generative grammar. So first, we start out with a lexicon, and these are our words. And we send our words into our syntactic domain in our brain, and we have first a deep structure, so this is an initial tree that you start out with, and then it undergoes some transformation. So this is where movement occurs. So movement occurs in the transformations. And then the surface structure ends up becoming what we say. So think of it as having three different components, the deep structures in our mind, and then in our mind some more movement occurs, and then the surface structure is what comes out. And then all of our acceptable sentences make up our grammar. Now let's get into something that really demonstrates movement at kind of a simple level that isn't just morphology, but is movement of whole words. So we can have a statement like you will leave, and we can make it a question. And the question that we form with these three words you will leave is will you leave? What's happening here? Well, what's happening is will is moving up to the front of the sentence. And that's probably the best way to think about it for now. The other alternative is that, well, maybe this you is moving down, but uh, that doesn't seem quite right, does it? Because nothing we've seen so far except for suffixes have moved down in our trees. Even with the VP internal subject hypothesis, our subjects are start at the bottom in the VP and they move up to the TP. So we would expect things to move up. Okay, what about James must leave? If we want to make that a question, we say must James leave. In other words, we take this thing in T, this modal, must, and we move it up to the front of the sentence. And this is subject auxiliary inversion. Another way we can think of it a little more colloquially is that they just switch positions. But as we'll see in our trees, saying they switch positions isn't a good way to put it because there's actually no switching at all. It's just movement of one of the words. Let's take a look. You will leave, and we want to make this question, will you leave? Before we introduce the complementizer phrases with C heads, and our C heads always had this minus Q in there, but this time we want to have a question, so we have this plus Q. And what happens when C has plus Q under it? Well, what it's saying is that it's asking for something. It's asking for T to move up to C. So when C has this plus Q in here, it's saying, look, this is not a valid question unless whatever is in T moves up to C. So we end up getting rid of will and T, and will moves up to C. And now this is the question, will you leave? And that's all there is to it. At least as far as movement in our tree and the surface representation, this is how we do movement to get our questions. So just to kind of expose you to this, normally we don't just cross out a word there. We can leave a trace. And what does a trace look like? Well, we leave a T, and then we put an index like I, so this would be T sub I, and then we can take our head, our C, and we can subscript it to CI. And this means that whatever was in T is no longer there, and instead it's moved up to the CI position. In other words, the complementizer head. Does this seem pretty straightforward? Well, it can get a little more complicated. Now, you have eaten shark. What do we see? Well, we see the perfect that we've seen last. So we have some morphology there on eaten, we have have here, and when we do subject auxiliary inversion, or just T to C movement, which we can call it now, we still notice that the EN is on the main verb. And this suggests that, yeah, really, have does originate where we've said it does in the perfect phrase, and that there is movement. Because otherwise, we'd say, well, how did this perfect get its morphology all the way down on Eaton when there's other NP or DP in the way? So you have eaten shark can become have you eaten shark? And again, all we see is some inversion. But this isn't in T, right? Or is it? 
Well, if we remember from the last video, if we have our perfect phrase here, this en morphology moves down to eat, and then if t is empty, have moves up into t. And because have is moved up to t, it can then move once again up to c and be have there. So there is this cyclic movement where this plus q on c only pulls the thing in t up. It doesn't pull anything else up. So in order to get have to the front of the sentence, we have to have that this have moves up to t first. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to pull it up to c. And then this would give us the word order, have you eaten shark? So this en would appear down here, and this perf would become a trace. So this would be a ti. It would move up to t. And then once again, we would have the same trace, and this would end up in ci. So I'm just labeling this to make it very explicit where it goes, because we'll see these traces further along in the lecture series when I have to show movement before on a tree, otherwise the screen gets too cluttered, and I'll always signal it with these uh, traces with subscripts. So this is cyclic movement. Now, here's the question. What if we have a perfect phrase and a progressive phrase? What is okay? In the first one, here's our statement. In the second one, we have, have you been eating? So the perfect phrase is moving up to the front. But what's not okay is if we take both of them and move them up to the front, or if we just take the second one and move it up to the front. These ones are not okay. So what does that tell us? Well, let's take a look at this. So first of all, our suffixes move down. So we'll get you have been eating. And now we want to move something to the top. Well, the only thing that can move to the top, so if we did have been you eating, we'd have to take both the perfect and the progressive and move them together up to the top. And that just can't work because we can't have two heads under C. We can only have one head. Then the question is, why can't we do bean you have eating? Well, if we did that, that would mean that this bean is skipping over the perfect phrase, going up to T and then moving up to C. But what we haven't really discussed yet is that we really want to pull the closest thing up to T. We can't just pull any verb phrase that comes after t up to t, we have to pull the closest one up to t. And that is why we cannot pull being up. Instead, because have is closer to t, we have to take have, move it up to t first, and then move the remaining thing up to t. And then we get the word order, have you been eating? And then that's a correct sentence. Now this might seem kind of circular, because I'm saying the tree tells us that this is ungrammatical, but really trees don't tell us whether things are ungrammatical, it's our grammar that tells us what's ungrammatical. So when you say, well, why does it have to be the case that this happens? Well, here is the data. Here is the data. We're saying these are bad, so we need to construct an argument for our trees such that these come out bad. And the argument that predicts this is if we assume that only the closest verb can move up to t. Alright, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I'll answer them the best that I can.